There are seven warning signs to look for when applying everybody's favorite sound bite, show, don't tell. And these signs will make perfect sense to you if you understand why this advice is given. There's neuroscience which explains everything. But before we go into that science, let's pick some better words that better convey what show and tell mean. Instead of tell, think inform. Informing, aka telling, is basically just stating facts. For show, think invoke instead. Invoking, aka showing, is simulating an experience. That's what show don't tell is saying. Don't feed me information, give me an experience. Unseasoned writers tend to predominantly feed information on account of them being unaware of the techniques I'll cover. They're simply going off of the raw, instinctual ways information is conveyed. Basically, they lack artistry. And that's okay. We all start there. What's important is that we learn how to grow and better communicate our visions to others. Now, you know what the what is? Here's the why. Everything you experience, the screen you're looking at right now, the phone or keyboard you felt when clicking on this video, the sound you're hearing, isn't experienced directly. Our perception of the external world is not an objective reality, but rather a subjective representation constructed by the brain. We experience a hallucination based on the stimuli provided to us by our senses. This is important to us writers because it explains what makes some books more immersive than others. The brain is taking what is provided from prose and constructing a model world inside the reader's head. This is why grammar matters and why evoking is more powerful than informing. Us writers are creating neural movies. What we choose to write about and how we choose to present it dictates what our reader's brain constructs. And if the brain constructs the right thing, it rouses emotions, engages the imagination, and hacks the reader's brain into responding as if this was real. So, if you want to ensure there's a movie in the heads of your audience instead of just your own, here's what you need to look out for. 1. Descriptive Dialogue Tags Using tags like bemoaned, demanded, or whatever other creative descriptors draws attention to itself and robs the reader of the ability to interpret the dialogue for themselves. Just say said or asked. They are nearly invisible to readers, allowing people to focus on the dialogue itself. If you believe you need the tag, either you lack faith in your reader or your dialogue isn't strong enough. Oh, and if you are using said or asked or so on, try not to tack on adverbs either. It has the same effect. You're telling the reader the emotion instead of showing them it through actions or the dialogue itself. Now. The one exception to this is if you're trying to convey volume. Just try not to overdo it. 2. Realize and wonder as thoughts. Again, with these, you're informing us of what someone thought or realized instead of letting us experience it. Present their internal dialogue instead. Also, you can get away with this more in first person POV. 3. The words immediately, suddenly, and finally. Immediately doesn't add anything and it's cleaner to just get rid of it. Suddenly and finally, meanwhile, can be improved by showing through action and dialogue. The narrative's flow is just better without these, more often than not. Four, adjective generalities. If you give the reader a generalization or use an abstraction, you're giving conclusions rather than providing evidence for the reader to reach their own conclusions. Generalities leave too much room for interpretation. The mind prefers specific details. If you want to make something vivid, research has found that three specific qualities of the subject should be described. 5. Static verbs This is where I often see the most issues. Verbs tend to be divided into two classes, dynamic verbs and static verbs. Static verbs pretty much tell the reader about the state of being of something or quietly link stuff together. Were, was, are, being, and been are examples of linking verbs. Helping verbs, meanwhile, are ones like may, might, should, could, had. The list goes on and on. It helps to avoid these as much as possible for stronger, more dynamic verbs. Strong nouns and dynamic verbs should be at the heart of your style. They grab people. As sin and syntax best states, 
Verbs determine whether a writer is a wimp or a wizard. Novices rely on was and other static verbs more often, and because of this, they often stumble into passive voice, which isn't ideal because of the model construction nature of the mind. See, grammar is a film director. It dictates what to model and when, and it starts modeling words as soon as we read them. There is no waiting. This is why active sentence construction is far more powerful than passive stuff. Active grammar enables the reader to visualize the scene as they would if they were actually witnessing it in person. Passive senses are more difficult because they're slower and thus make for a less immersive and less engaging reading experience. This note on static verbs includes sensory verbs as well. Saying something tasted good or a character saw something or they heard something is intrusive. Giving us the details is immersive for the reasons I stated before with generalities. Before we move on to the next section, I must add this note of caution. These terms don't always indicate telling. For instance, similes can use these and get away with it due to what it's providing visually. Furthermore, when you're using guide narrators, you can include these more. This style allows for it. I wouldn't recommend defaulting to it for reasons I've discussed, but you can do it. 6. Explaining motivations using to. I'm sure you can figure out why this can be a problem at this point. You're preventing the reader from experiencing events as they happen. If you need to include motivations, add internal dialogues or tags. And finally, the one which annoys me the most. 7. Naming emotions. Telling emotions keeps the readers at arm's length instead of experiencing it with them. It can also strip away all the layers and nuances of emotion. When you take this away, you take away the power of prose because, as I've often said, prose's greatest strength is the ability to immerse into a character's experience. So how do you show emotion? Simple. First, as always, we have thoughts. Internal dialogue helps showcase a lot about what someone is experiencing. There's also regular dialogue. Dialogue expresses our ideas, thoughts, beliefs, and needs, which all comes from our emotional states. With dialogue, you can also add vocal cues, which connects well to what I spoke of in the first tip. These are especially great for non-POV characters, since the reader can't see into the character's internal world, but they can interpret their tones. If you don't want to use words at all, you can use body language. Again, this is great for non-POV characters, so it is still good for POV characters as well. Finally, if someone is the POV character, visceral reactions are the most powerful form of nonverbal communication. These are intrinsic reactions all people experience. These evoke a primary response from readers who can recognize them with ease and establish a stronger emotional bond. Just be careful not to overdo it since too much of it can create melodrama. Anyway, this is all part of how to apply show, don't tell. Now, full disclosure, I don't actually agree with show don't tell as a golden rule. I clearly understand why people say it, but I also understand that there are moments where you do wish to inform. I utilize what I like to call sliding third person, which informs at key strategic points. I could easily tell you when these moments are and why, but that's a whole other video. If you wish to know when that video drops, subscribe to the channel. You'll receive both it and many more lessons related to storytelling.